You may be seated. This morning as we get started, if you have your Bibles and you want to open or it'll be up on the screen, but in John, the 10th chapter, and verses 11 and uh, verse uh, 14, I'm going to read this morning. Uh, he says here in that uh, 11th verse, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. <laughs> Who is that I am? I am is Jesus. Now, the I am demands respect. The I am demands authority in our life. He is the authority. Uh, we live in a, a country where authority seems to be ignored. Police officer says stop. Nowadays they want to run. School teachers try to demand respect in a classroom and they get no help from at home. I can guarantee you when I went to school, if they got a report that I was bad at school and they got it, <laughs> I was going to get it when I got home. I. Uh, got to be a freshman in high school, and it took me 22 years to get there, but I finally got to be a freshman in high school. And uh, my ag teacher told me I was gonna judge chickens. I said, I'm not gonna judge chickens, I'm gonna either have sheep, hogs, or cattle. I said, nope, we don't have anybody else to do chickens, and you're gonna do chickens. I took my stand and I said, I'm not gonna do it. So uh, I went down to get my hair cut. I had hair then. And I went down to get my hair cut and the barbers had found out about it and they uh, began to give me a hard time. And uh, I took my stand at the barber shop. I'm not judging chickens. Now my dad was a little taller than I am and uh, was about the size of Tom East. And he could fill my bedroom door, and he stepped in my bedroom door, and he had a belt in his hand. And I knew he wasn't going to put it on his pants. <laughs> and he said, Mr. Brewer called me and said, you were not going to judge chickens. I took my stand with that big man, and I said, I'm not going to judge chickens. I not only judge chickens, but I got the best grade out of the whole class. He got my respect. But we serve a heavenly father that deserves our respect. And we need to be obedient to his call. We need to hear his voice. We need to know when he, he talks to us. Now he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And then verse 14 said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. In other words, there becomes a relationship between our Heavenly Father and us. And we know that we know that when he, he talks to us. Now, we all need the good shepherd. We all need Jesus. Now, I'm going to do a little bit of a comparison this morning between sheep and people. Now, when you go out, you might say, bye. <laughs> but as you uh, go out of here this morning, I'm going to ask that there be some scripture that you take ownership of. Now, folks, it's good to take ownership of scripture. It needs to become a part of us. 
It needs to be whenever we're going through that difficult time in life that we can reach back into the memory bank and pull out the scripture that's going to give us the strength to take us through what it is that we're going through. Now, sheep get lost easily. Now, you wives don't reach over and poke your husband, but I'm sure there's quite a few wives in here that say, I've been on more than one trip with my husband when he got lost. And sheep are easily to get lost. They have to have a shepherd. They have to have somebody to give them some direction. They have to have somebody to say, turn here, turn there. Now, I got a friend of mine that I hadn't seen in several years. And uh, he's been an evangelist, and he would come to my church, and he would preach every so often. I'd have him uh, about every three or four years to come and do me a a sermon. And, And I always ask him, I said, you've got one sermon. I want you to preach while you're here. And it was my favorite sermon that he had, and it was entitled, Ugly Aunt Betty. Now, if there's any Bettys in here, that's no reference to you. But Ugly Aunt Betty was one of my favorite sermons that this guy could preach. And what it was, he was raised on a farm, and on this farm they had some sheep. And they had one sheep that had a bad eye, and it had a bent up, crumpled up ear. And it was just an ugly sheep. And him and his brothers thought it looked a little bit like their Aunt Betty. (laughs) And so one evening it was getting late and the sheep hadn't come in and they hadn't got them all there. And when they'd done their count, they was missing one sheep. And it was ugly Aunt Betty. And he said the search was on. They began to go out and they looked and they looked and they looked and they finally found ugly Aunt Betty. And when they found her, she was lodged in some brush and she couldn't get out on her own. Well, he said, us boys loved ugly Aunt Betty. Said we got her out. We took her to the house. We cleaned her up made sure that she got something to eat. And he said, we applied that love to Betty. Now, that was just a sheep. But they also loved their Aunt Betty, that they referred to the ugly old sheep as ugly Aunt Betty. But they went looking for her, and that's the way Jesus would do us, because he told us he left the 90 and 9, and he went out and he looked for that very one, I'm sure that if I would ask for a raise of hands in here today, there's probably quite a few in here that could raise their hand and say, well, I I really felt like God singled me out today. And I know that I've been in services where I felt like that God singled me out. And I knew that I knew that God was speaking to my heart. But all of us have a little tendency once in a while to get lost. Now, my wife's not here today, and so I'll tell the story on her. But uh, we were going into a very large city, and they had drawn my wife a map. And she was the navigator, I was doing the driving. Now, you men could say, that's your first mistake, letting her be in the navigator. But I never will forget it. She said, turn right here, so I turned right there. Turn left here, so I turned left there. Pretty soon, turn left here, and I turned left there. And she had me make another left turn, and pretty soon I looked up, and we were right back to where she had me make the first right turn. And I said something about it, and... She began to tell me, you go right up here. And I went up there, and you make a left, and you go down here, and you make another left. And 
And pretty soon we're right back to where we were at again. I said, give me that map. I took the map. She had the map upside down. Well, we eventually found where we were going to go. But all of us at different times have a tendency to get lost. And we have a tendency to stray as sheep, as people, as we try to follow the Lord. And it's so easy to do. You can stray a little bit watching something on TV you don't need to watch. There's just all kinds of things that kind of come up and temptations that come up in life. And as we go through life, we'll find that these temptations come up. But we need to be able to hear the call of the master's voice. Now, I can uh, relate to one time particular in listening to the master's voice. I'd been pastoring here. And uh, in pastoring here, I had a guy that called me up one day and said, uh, we want you to come and be our pastor. Now this church was only running about 30 some people. They hadn't paid their budgets the year before. And uh, the house that they wanted me to live in, it would freeze the plants in the wintertime. And uh, I said, no, I'm, I'm not going to go. Well, they said, uh, would you pray about it if we'd go on an all-expense fishing trip? Now, this wasn't in February. This was uh, in nice weather. I couldn't turn down the invitation for an all-expense. So I said, sure, I'll, I'll go. You're paying the way. I'll go fishing with you. And we went down in the Ozarks and went fishing. And I left. I stayed up to my bargain. I was praying about it. And we was in like a little trailer. And, and I was in that little trailer praying about, uh, Lord, uh, should I go? Now, I'm going to tell you right now, Doug didn't want to go. But I was doing what I told him I'd do. I was praying, Lord, should I go? And uh, I wasn't getting any vibes, no feelings, anything. There just wasn't anything there. And at the end of this prayer, there was a turtle dove cooing outside. I could hear that turtle dove cooing. And they've got a very distinctive coo, and they've got a very distinctive fly, when they fly away, you can hear them, they fly, and I heard that turtle dove flew away, so old Smarty just throwed it out real quick, he said, Lord, if you want me to go to that church and be their pastor, let me hear that thing coo seven more times, seven more times, I had an answer for the Lord, Lord, how do I know that's the same turtle dove? So we had a guy that here in the church that was wanting to go out to Nazarene Bible College. He couldn't afford to move out. And they had a guy that was up in Loveland, Colorado that was wanting to come to Illinois to pastor a church and they couldn't afford to move him. So I talked to a friend of mine that had a 54 passenger bus and asked him if we could use it to move one out and move the other one back. And to show you how the Lord works things out, I didn't have the money to to do the move, and the church wasn't offering to pay to do the move. But a guy at the front door handed me $500 and said, use this for whatever you need. I'll move them out and move the other one back. So on the way out, everything went fine. We got out to Colorado Springs, unloaded, went up to Loveland, Colorado, loaded his furniture up. And I'm driving that old bus coming across Kansas, and it's just before daylight, and I'm up there praying about this thing, about whether I ought to take that church or not. I mean, I hadn't got over that turtle dove cooing seven times. Now, the Lord says, you'll know his voice. And I knew that God was speaking to me that morning. And so I threw out another fleece, and I'm not one to throw out a lot of fleeces, and especially now. I said, Lord, if you really want me to go, 
I want you to show me three turtle doves this morning before I get out of the state of Kansas. We was almost to Missouri. That sun popped up and two turtle doves flew by and I said, I said three, and the third one almost hit the windshield of the bus. <laughs> now, I'm going to tell you what I feared. I've got to tell my wife. We had a daughter that I knew that when she graduated was wanting to go to college. I was going to take a cut in pay. I was going to take her to a place. We had a nice, what's this, the office now? We had a nice parsonage to live in. We had a good church here. I love the people here. What, how am I going to tell her? So as most good husbands would do, I mustered up the strength and I said, Honey, I've got something I need to tell you. We're going to move. And when I told her where we were going, she was not a happy camper. But I want to tell you one thing about my wife. If she said anything in her life was back when we answered our call to preach, I remember my pastor said, when you follow him wherever he goes. And she said yes. So I knew that she would follow me to the new church to be their pastor. But she came up with something that shocked me. She said, instead of a turtle dove, why didn't you pick out a parrot? <laughs> now this is the honest truth. We're traveling back up from southern Illinois with that bus, just her and me. She had told me that. And a vehicle comes by us with a birdcage on it and a parrot standing on top of that birdcage. <laughs> now he says that we will know his voice. It was confirmed to me that's what we were supposed to do. And so we went there for eight years and had a successful ministry. God was good to us. People were saved. The church up there got itself out of debt. It, it uh, was able to go into a new building program, and uh, God just blessed the whole thing. But it happened because of obedience to I am. My wife was bragging on this church yesterday. We were at a 50th wedding anniversary, and my wife was bra bragging on this church about the layman that step up and do the will of God. That's the reason we had 930 some people in this church on it. That's the reason we had 800 and some in here on Super Bowl Sunday. It's because of the obedience of listening to what God is telling us to do. Now, sheep get lost. And also, sheep are stubborn. If you know somebody that's stubborn, would you just raise your hand? Peggy Myers, I said, raise your hand, not point. <laughs> I tell you what, some people just will not follow directions. <laughs> but sheep are stubborn. They've got a, they've got a stubborn streak in it. And, and I'm sure that uh, you can probably think of several people that you think, man, they are stubborn. Now, what are you laughing for, Luann? I know you're thinking of your dad. But, <laughs> but sheep are stubborn. But on top of that, sheep are not only get lost and are, are, are stubborn, but uh, they get filthy dirty. And do you realize without Jesus Christ in our life, we are filthy dirty? We're unclean. We're, we're, we're kind of, before we know Jesus, we're kind of like the, the leper. We're unclean, and Jesus comes into our life and forgives us of our sin and washes us clean. Now, the 23rd Psalm, if I can find it. I know it's over here in the Old Testament. Well, 
If I'd get out of Isaiah, it would help. But the 23rd Psalm, I, 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 want you to, I want you to take ownership of this. I want to tell you, what I'm preaching here today, your pastor told me this is what I was supposed to preach along I am. He wanted to keep the, the thing rolling with his, with his theme. So if you don't like the message, when Pastor Trent gets home, just say, why did you do this? But I want you to take this 23rd Psalm and I want you to take ownership of it. Ownership of it. You know where I heard the tw first time of the 23rd Psalm? I heard it at my father's funeral. My wife's pastor, where she went to church and her family went to church, preached it at my father's funeral. I'd never heard the 23rd Psalm before that time. And you know what I always connected up with? I connected up that that, that, that psalm was for my father. It was for the dead. But the 23rd Psalm is for the living. That's us. And if you go back and read the history of what David had been going through, you know that it was a troubled time. And folks, each and every one of us, we're going to hit those times in our life and I didn't realize it that day, but that pastor was reading the 23rd Psalm for the Romine family that day. For us to grab a hold of, for us to take ownership of, for us to reach in and grab some strength with. And so when Pastor Trent told me what I was going to be preaching and I come across this, and I've been reading the 23rd Psalm every day now for almost two weeks. I missed one day of reading the 23rd Psalm. But listen to this. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. Doesn't that just reach out and grab you? Put your name in there? The Lord is my shepherd. Ben, he's your shepherd. He's your shepherd. He's the one that's going to bring you in. He's the one that's reached out and, and touched your life. He says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leaves me beside quiet waters. And did you know that uh, sheep will not drink out of running water? They've got to have quiet water. And when he talks about he makes me to lie down in green pastures, sheep are not normally animals that lay down, but when their stomach is full and they're satisfied, they will lay down. Isn't it something how we kind of go along and say, well, I can see this in the sheep, but I can also see this in people? He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anointeth my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord for how long? Forever. Forever. <laughs> yes, sir. He's our guide. Just like the story that I told you about when God spoke to me about leaving this church as a, a senior pastor back there years ago and going to another church. That's the way we ought to be. There ought to be things in our life about what we ought to do and then know that we're going to walk in the light. You know, I'll never forget when I was answering my, my call to preach. Mr. Paulson, we know that we know that we know when God has called us. But on a Sunday morning, I felt like for sure that God was calling me. 
I couldn't hardly read nor write. And I thought, oh, how, how could this ever be? And so Sunday, when church was over, I asked my pastor if I could talk to him. And we went down into the little Sunday school room office and we started talking. And I told him, I said, uh, I, I, I got this feeling, I think God is, God is calling me to preach. But I, I wanted to make sure it, it had to be of God. And he talked and he talked and we prayed and we talked and pretty soon we began to hear noises and people were coming into Sunday night church. We stayed in there all afternoon. I mean, I cried a bucket full of tears down there in that office that day. One, and he'd say, I can't tell you that God's calling you to preach. We got in the service and a lady by the name of Jackie Scooter was leading the song service. Jackie got up and she said, uh, you know, we sing the same old songs all the time. She said, let's sing a new song tonight. Jesus calls us. Before she got through the first verse, I hit that altar. And folks, I want to tell you, that's what these altars are for. You can come and settle things at an altar. And I went down to that altar and I began to pray. And the moment that I said, yes, the fire fell and it was sealed. Old dummy was going to school. And my mother said, you'll never make it. You can't read. You can't write good enough. God's called me to go. I've got to go. You don't have no money. I don't have a job. And I applied at Olivet Nazarene University. And believe it or not, they accepted old dummy to go. And it wasn't but just a short time after that. I even had a job offered to me up there. A district superintendent come along and spoke the words Nazarene Bible College for fat guys that were married and had kids and couldn't afford to go to school out in Colorado Springs. And I knew that I knew that old fat soap was going to Colorado. And I went down to the bank. And when I went into that bank, I said, I need to borrow a thousand dollars. Well, what do you need a thousand dollars for? God's called me to preach. You know, the scripture says a prophet has no honor in his homeland. And one of the reasons I think that is is because some of them used to try to drink the, where they lived at it dry. And everybody around there knew me. They knew who I was. But a lot of them didn't know about what Jesus had done in my heart. And I said, God's called me to preach. And I'm going to go to Nazarene Bible College in Colorado Springs. <laughs> he said, you can't move out there for $1,000. I said, that's what God wants me to do is borrow $1,000. Didn't have a thing to put up for collateral. Just borrowed $1,000 on my name. I don't know of any bank you can hardly do that with in town today. That you can go in and borrow $1,000 of. But I went in there and borrowed it, and away I went. My mother said, you'll never make it. But she showed up at my graduation. But I knew that God was guiding in my life, and sheep need a guide. That's the reason we recognize his voice. And you know what else the good shepherd provides? Look at verse 2 down here. He makes me to lie down in green pastures and leads me beside quiet waters. In other words, do I look like I've ever went hungry? No sir, brother, I breed anorexia. <laughs> but God has provided all the way wherever I've been. He's always provided. And I thank you for his provisions that he's had there. But there's something else that the Lord does. The good shepherd corrects. You'll notice down there in verse 4, he talks about his rod and his staff. 
That rod's just not for good looks. That rod is there for protection, but it's also there for correction. Now, Herc, things have changed a little bit since she was in the Navy. But I remember back when I went into boot camp, they like to scared me to death. And they demanded respect. And they had a guy that had a sword. And we'd go to them classes and they'd have you up half the night. And if you want to sleep, they would thump you on the head with that sword. They would get your attention. That's one of the things that's wrong with our society. It doesn't follow correction very well. Nowadays, if they want to get out of the military, I quit! Okay, go on. If they act up now, get out, go on. But folks, if we ever really go to war, we need to be able to follow. And we need to be able to follow it. And that's one of the good things that's happening in this church here is you're following your leadership. You know when pastor got up here and said, I want to win people, everything just short, if I have to go all the way, but I'll not do sin to win people to Christ. But folks, he's done some things that's went against the grain on some people. But you know what? There's people that are coming to church right now that hadn't been coming, and we ought to be praising God and getting behind him and say, Sick him, brother! You've heard the old story about the lady that I told one time about the lady that come to church and I knew I was hitting her. You can always tell when you're hitting them once in a while. And uh, I was hitting her pretty good and I knew it. And when I got done preaching, I went to the back door and, well, pastor, I want you to know I agreed with everything you said today. I said, I didn't hear you say amen. She said, you don't say sick them to a bulldog and he's got you by the seat of the britches. But we need correction. And then down here in uh, the fifth verse, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anointed my head with oil, and my cup overflows. I didn't look this up, but I never will forget. I was probably about 11, 12 years of age, and uh, I used to help some on a dairy farm, and they had some sheep. And I remember walking into a little place there that they had a, a sheep laying in there, there, and it was just panting real hard and laying down, and you could just tell that the sheep was dying. Now, sheep are defenseless. I mean, they, they give up easy. They, they just lay over and, and die. And uh, I said, well, what's, what's wrong with it? Now this may sound a little gross, but they said, well, flies will get in their nostrils and go up their nose and lay their eggs and the larvae will hatch out and some of it goes up into the brain and they, it'll, it'll eventually kill them. And so they can anoint their head with oil to keep the flies off. We need a shepherd. Did you ever notice Grandma had a rain barrel? Nellie Linder probably has had a rain barrel in the past. And Mr. Gillett, it would have been good for you to wash your hair in a rain barrel. But that's what they used to use that rainwater for, was to wash their hair with. And everything was fine as long as you kept a fresh rain coming. But when the rains quit and that burrow sat there, you could go and look at it and there's these little things in there going all over. Just, and what it was was mosquito, mosquito larvae in there that had hatched out in that rain barrel because it had become stagnant. And you know what? We, we need to have a shepherd to help us that we don't become stagnant. That we just don't dry up. That we get to the place that we begin to dwindle. I'll just give you a little statistic. When I 
I came to this district in, in 1976. We had about 115 churches on the Southern Illinois district. That's from Rantoul all the way down to Metropolis. We've got about 70 some churches left on the Illinois district. You know what happened? They didn't listen to the shepherd. Do you know what a New Testament church is? It's a growing church. A New Testament church is a growing church. A New Testament church is a, an obedient church. They, they follow Jesus. And you might say, well, that's why I want to lead me to my death. I want to tell you, it'll lead you to eternal life. Follow Jesus. There's something about that name. I'm going to throw this challenge out to you. Why don't for the next two weeks, you just go home and at least once a day, read the 23rd Psalm and let that Psalm begin to speak to you about the I Am. He's the good shepherd. The I Am. We all need Jesus. Jesus, there's just something about that name. Brother Bass, would you and your group come this morning? You know, this morning, Pastor has made it so available. Every